welcome to the first episode of the Rumcast, which is a new podcast designed to help you navigate the world of rum by talking to some of the people who shape it. I'm Will Hookinga, and joining me as co-host all the way from Miami, Florida, is John Gullah. John, how's it going? Hey, good, Will. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited to get this episode out. I know we've already recorded a couple of interview episodes that are up and out there for people to listen to but you know we thought it would be a good idea also to have a separate episode to sort of just introduce ourselves to people and give them a little window into our relationship to rum and and sort of why we're doing this Um, so yeah i'm excited to get into it it's been a busy holiday season i know we originally wanted to get this out in december it's january now obviously we did not make our self-imposed deadline (laughs) Um, so we are going to get this out though uh in january so uh hopefully if you're listening to this and it's uh not february yet i am correct in my prediction so yeah (laughs) i'm excited to get into this i'm very excited too will and uh i agree i mean the holidays are are always a time where it's different than the rest of the year and uh, we were able to get a lot done in that space but i think we both wanted to make sure that we had uh like you said enough episodes out there for people to kind of follow along and also we felt like this one was important uh to get done before we put those out as well so yeah uh, speaking of holidays Days, though uh how was your holiday experience this year it was great there were some you know nice uh rum filled moments i was able to pick up a few interesting bottles and things like that before i headed off to visit family so um you know i'm the kind of person who shows up to uh, the parents and the in-laws house with bottles already in <laughs> tow not because i don't trust their selection but just because like i picked up a few and i can't wait until i get home in order to try them again you know so i wanted to have them around one of those was a uh, a barrel pick from a group of of people on facebook called the rum caucus they actually awesome. They took a trip up to visit Privateer Rum in Ipswich, Massachusetts, which is kind of apropos to this conversation because yeah. uh, Maggie Campbell from Privateer is one of the people we interviewed for one of the episodes we've already done. So, But they did a barrel pick. Um, they they came back with two. They, they did two barrel picks, actually. One mm-hmm. was a uh, Privateer Rum that was finished in Laphroaig scotch casks and it was very smoky I didn't pick up that bottle I picked up the other one which is a uh, queen share rum that uh, came from a particular barrel that they liked a lot and uh, it was it was great Uh, that's the one I picked I did get to sample the uh, smoky Laphroaig cask finished one and it was it honestly like yeah I I had to pick it up at a liquor store where uh, the the guy who owns it was holding some bottles for people and he let me try some of his that was finished in in the Lefroy cask and yeah. it made me regret uh not picking that one up as well because it was it was fantastic like just the right amount of that peaty smoke from from the scotch yeah. not overbearing like it still tastes like rum it was it was really good so i've never had Lefroy. uh have you you've had Lefroy itself yeah so actually i was gifted a bottle of Lefroy tenure uh from my sister and brother-in-law it's it's something that's been on my list uh i've, I've had it before but there's there's a specific cocktail called uh a penicillin that I've always wanted to make at home, and it involves uh, floating a little bit of Lefroy tenure on top huh. uh, after you mix it. It's it's a blended Scotch whiskey based cocktail, so it's lemon juice, Scotch, yeah. a honey ginger syrup, and then you float the smoky Lefroy tenure on top, and it's kind of like a like a smoky cold hot toddy sort of because you have that lemon juice and you have that honey and the warmth from the gender yeah so it's it's really good but uh but yeah so i've heard lefroig described as a tire fire some people say (laughs) some people say band-aids is something that people get from it and it's one of those things where i see where they're coming from like i taste that a little bit but it's it's uh it's it's still nice to me and enjoyable i like it it's not like you know i hear where it's coming from but it's that's more of an accent when i taste it as opposed to like oh this tastes like band-aids the feature (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah, it's yeah exactly i'm looking forward to trying that yeah so what about you any interesting encounters with rum over the holidays yeah, I did. So I did have a couple. Um, I think I would put myself in the former category as bringing those bottles in tow because I don't trust my family's <laughs> selection. <laughs> sure. Um, but, it, you know, I'll be honest, I visited my mom up in North Florida uh, and we really didn't have room to bring anything. So mm-hmm. I didn't bring anything uh, with me. And I regretted that immediately when I got there. <laughs> 
<laughs> you're in kind of a um, desert y- yeah and uh the selection at the house was uh not not usually what i would go for so uh what we did was i my brother was there i haven't seen him in like five plus years he's in the coast guard so oh, wow. that was really cool to have him and uh so he was interested i was telling him you know some of the stuff we're doing and we went and we found a liquor store in the area and the area that my mom moved to is really rural and yeah. there was not a whole lot of selection. Uh-huh. So when we got there, it was pretty much the standard, like, bottom shelf rum stuff sure. that you would expect. But they did have uh, one thing that I was interested in and I haven't tried yet. And so I went ahead and, and picked that up based on recommendations that I've seen off of the forums and off of other places online, which is the Plantation uh, Stiggins Fancy Pineapple Rum. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm exactly the same with that rum. I always hear it being recommended as something great and something that's not the typical, you know, artificial tasting flavored rum. And I just haven't reached for it yet. Uh, But, you know, I make cocktails at home all the time and I always see it. And I'm like, you know, I know I'm going to buy a bottle of that someday. It just hasn't happened yet. So what did you think and what did like what did you do with it? So the the good news was that not only was it there, but the price was right. And so exactly like you said, I was exactly in the same way. I've always kind of passed it over. Right. But since there was less uh, options here, this was the choice. And I also felt like it was a good appropriate kind of a, a rum to start with uh, since my brother really hadn't been introduced to it. So yeah, I was I was able to grab that and uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, I think uh, it's, a, it's a really good rum. It's Obviously, I don't think it's a primarily a sipping rum. It is more of a mixing rum. Um, but that said, I, I did sip it and I did enjoy it. It. And sure. it doesn't doesn't taste uh, like artificial at all. I, I think they've done a really really good job at, at building that product. So I was able to make it, you know, like a, a pina colada for him uh, and his fiance, and they both super enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, like it was like in the enlightenment moment of like, wow, you know, this is really good and different than what they've had at like you know a poolside cabana with the frozen you know rum stuff. Right. And uh, so that was good. And it went even further than that, which I'm I'm happy to say uh, is that he asked, can I like try it straight? And I said, sure. I said, I find this pleasing. I said, there's better <laughs> sipping rums out there for sure. And I don't mean that as a, a dig on the product. I sure. think the product's actually really good. But I do I do like to say, though, that it, in the right situation, every, every rum it, uh, become, <laughs> becomes a sipping rum. So, uh, You know what? I agree with you. <laughs> and one of those is family gatherings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, he liked it even uh, straight. And I told him, you know, boy, if you like that, wait till, wait till you see some of the other stuff. So really exciting to see... Uh, uh, that you know, other people uh, when they're exposed to good rum products uh, see the light so quickly and easily, and it's not like you have to convince them to do that. So yeah, that's always a fun moment when you get to share a bottle with someone else and kind of bring them into the world a little bit for the first time. Yeah, so I- I'm excited. I told them all about the podcast and uh, that we were what we're creating and what we're doing, and they were excited for that. So they're looking forward to it. Yeah, so so am I, and I think that's you know you talking about introducing your brother and that being one of his first rum experiences is a nice transition into how we wanted to do this episode a little bit. So before we get into that, I do want to point out to people, like I said, we do have two other episodes already recorded with interviews. Uh, One is with Eric Kay of Holmes Key, and the other is with Maggie Campbell from Privateer Rum, who, who we talked about a little bit already. So that is kind of the format I think you can expect from the podcast going forward. You know, we want to talk to people who are out there shaping the world of rum, whether that is distillers, independent bottlers, representatives from brands, bartenders, writers, you know, whoever is involved in kind of being a part of this and making it what it is. So I think we'll also likely mix in some other segments and experiments yeah. along the way. You know, as I said, this is new. We want to try different things, find out what people enjoy listening to and that sort of thing. So always open on that front. But yeah, the goal is always just to be, uh, you know, giving you another window into the people and brands who are doing interesting things and shaping the world of rum. Yeah, I'm really interested in uh, in doing that. And I'm really happy with the format we've come up with the interviews are wonderful i'm i'm looking forward to some of the other segments that we're going to be doing and uh those type of uh rum conversations that we can have with us and with others and and just exploring the world and the hobby of rum in general so 
I know our goal was to be, uh, we're hoping to get you at least one episode a month uh, that you can listen to, if not two. And we want to make sure everybody knows where to go for for more info on the podcast. Uh, Really quickly, we do have a website. It's www.rumcast.com. And our social media presence for Facebook and Instagram is The Rumcast. So we just, we thought, uh, like Will said, I think it's a really important thing for us to share a little bit about us uh, as well and why we're here and why we're doing this. Yeah, I always find like a fun way to kind of find out what people's relationship is to rum is is to just hear a little bit of how they came to it in the first place. You know, there's an article that came out this year that I enjoyed a lot, or actually it was 2019, so I can't say this year anymore. So last year, (laughs) um, Karen Hoskin, who is the uh, co-founder of Montagna Rum in Colorado, wrote this piece for their blog. Uh, all about this idea called the continuum of rum. And, it, you know, this applies to basically any kind of hobby or, or interest or, mm-hmm. uh, you know, something you're interested in where everyone has sort of a different entry point into how they get into it. And then once you are into rum, you know, what brings you to rum, what you enjoy at first usually evolves. So, you know, what you're reaching for right away when you first start might be different five years down the line. What you're reaching for 10 years down the line might be a lot different from what you were drinking five years into the hobby. So uh, I I wanted to, you know, have each of us talk a little bit about how we came to rum and what our relationship is to it just beyond simply drinking it. So for me personally, I, I first got into rum by having a Mai Tai on my honeymoon in Hawaii. (laughs) And, you know, it it wasn't the classic Trader Vic recipe Mai Tai, but it also wasn't like, you know, the bastardized neon red Mai Tai that like, you know, doesn't have any of the uh, actual ingredients in it. It was yeah. it was kind of right in the middle. Uh, there was probably some pineapple juice in there, but I remember you know getting home and being like, you know, I want to learn how to make one of those. And so once you start looking that up, that's when you first start to hear about, um, you know, okay, you need a Jamaican rum, you need a Martinique rum. I, mm-hmm. I didn't know about any of this stuff, and so that was really what kind of kicked off the rabbit hole, and that was all the way back in uh, 2012. So it's been a, a cool journey since there, and then just over the last few years I've, I've been getting into it a little more seriously i am a uh, writer by trade that is what i do for my day job and so i had i kind of had the itch to want to start uh, some type of blog or something that allowed me to write about rum so in uh, the end of 2018 i decided to start a newsletter uh, covering the uh, kind of emerging uh, american rum industry I thought it would be fun. You know, I think there are a lot of producers in the U.S., small craft producers who are starting to do some interesting things with rum. Um, obviously, there's still there's also a lot that is not that great, but I think there are some true gems starting to come through. And I was curious to kind of follow along and, and help give people a little window into that. So I started something called American Rum Report, which is a weekly newsletter that goes out uh, about, you know, important stories in American rum, sometimes interviews and, and things like that. So I've been doing that for a year. It's been really cool. It's it's allowed me to talk regularly with distillers and all sorts of people like that. Um, I've been able to host some panels at rum events around the country, and it's it's been a really uh, fun, you know, way to explore and learn about something that I've become really passionate about. So, uh, you know, this podcast is an opportunity. You know, I always tell people because they meet people and they think I'm the American rum guy, and uh, <laughs> I, I am very interested in American rum, but I came to it like most people did by, you know, the global entry point of rum, and right. uh, I, I'm a citizen of the world when it comes to rum, uh, and so I, you know, I'm really excited to start a project that also allows me to uh, talk to all producers from all over the world and explore, you know, rums from everywhere. So that's a little bit about uh, my background. But but John, so, um, you know, and the two of us, that's kind of what brought us together was I was giving a panel at the Miami Rum Renaissance Festival, and you were in attendance because you live in Miami and you are a rum fan. So that kind of brought us together. And we had both had a podcast in the back of our minds of we wish there were more podcasts about rum. So we just kind of decided to make one. But yeah, so that's my, you know, entry point into the world of rum. What about you, John? Yeah, so when I met you first, I, I did know about American Rum Report already, and I happened to be at that rum event in Miami that you were doing the panel with. And... You got in on the ground floor because that was pretty early. <laughs> really? No, I didn't I didn't realize that. Yeah. Um, but it, so I had enjoyed the American Rum Report and the information that had come out of that. And then having seen you there, I was like, huh, that's, that's oh, I, you know, connected those pretty quickly. 
and, and thought to myself when I was watching you do the panel, okay, so uh, good writer, very much interested in rum, and also has a good speaking voice. So have you thought about a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> it's shocking uh, to me that your takeaway from that was good speaking voice because all, all, all I can think when I'm up there speaking is uh, I, I hope that people are not running for the doors right now. <laughs> Uh, I thought it was a nice event and I thought you did a good job. Um, Thank you. And so it seemed to me that, like you said, it was already kind of mulling around in the back of my mind uh, to do a podcast. And I'll explain kind of why now, which is that uh, I'm essentially slightly different than you will. I think I'm what I would call a rum fan or a rum enthusiast. um, And I haven't been in it as long as you have. Uh, So I would say my experience with rum actually goes back to roughly earlier 2018. So not all that long. Um, but prior to that, I was from kind of coming from the bourbon world as a bourbon enthusiast. The dark side. <laughs> and uh, prior to that, I had taken a trip over to Kentucky and did the bourbon trail experience. And I still enjoy bourbon to this day. But what was interesting to me when I kind of uh, first found rum in 2018 is that it is so much more of a diverse spirit. And I didn't find that out, of course, until after somebody had introduced me to uh, a decent rum mm-hmm. uh, just by chance. I was in the the, the liquor store here uh, near Miami, Florida liquor store, and uh, there was a special sale going on and they had like this event and I was looking at, through the bourbons because uh, I was collecting the bourbons. Uh, and this guy says, hey, uh, you like bourbon? I said, yes, uh, that's, you know, I like bourbon. And he says, come here. And he pours this thing for me, a little bit of a sip of this. And he goes, uh, he gives it to me and I, I, I taste it. I said, wow, that's really good. What what bourbon is that? And he said, it's not, it's, <laughs> it's rum. And <laughs> And, I, you know, like the shock on my face, I was like, what? Because, of course, for me, probably like a lot of people out there thought rum was the stuff that makes you sick in mixed drinks. Right. Uh, and that was like the extent of my thought with rum. So I talked to him a little more. He told me that this was a rum that was aged in bourbon casks. It ended up being a, a Barcelo Onyx. Mm-hmm. And I walked out with a bottle of that that day because I was just so impressed by it. And so that was where it kind of all started for me. Because uh, I found out that, wow, rum can be a, an, an, an aged rum can be a nice sipping spirit and similar to high end bourbons. Um, but it gave me something that was lacking in bourbon for me, which was there was a little bit more sweetness behind there. Not overwhelming or overpowering, of course, but something to go along with the spice and kind of balance it out. So from there, of course, that was where my rabbit hole started. And I went down that rabbit hole. And as I was explaining at the outset, Whereas bourbon is a very restricted kind of categorized spirit for the most part, it has this identity uh, that's very well defined and it does have a lot of rules uh, of what bourbon has to be. And so therefore, I think although there's plenty of differences in different products, there is a certain profile that it kind of sticks to. Right. What I found with rum, after getting into rum and, and figuring out all these different nations, as you said, being a citizen of the world of rum, I love that. Um, <laughs> And figuring out how much diversity can be in this spirit, not only with the aging process, but with uh, the terroir and and differences in molasses versus agricole and all these other things that we'll get into eventually, I'm sure, in the podcast uh, in depth. That's where my love of rum came from. That's where my journey started. And I kind of have developed over the time since then to figure out all the differences and, you know, the, the distillation process and all of the other things that make rum the diverse spirit that it is. Yeah, I I think that's great. And that, you know, that's part of what attracted me to it as well is there's there's so many different corners of the world to explore through rum. Basically anywhere sugarcane has touched, um, yeah. there's 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 something to explore there. And I always talk about rum as like it's it's kind of a lens to explore so like through which you can explore so many different parts of the world. So yeah. I, I love that about it too. And you know, uh, to kind of wrap things up on on this introductory episode, one thing we wanted to do in going back to that idea of a continuum of rum is is, is talk a little bit about since it's you know January and the new year, we had the idea of of talking about one rum each of us experienced in 2019 that we won't forget either because of the rum itself or just the experience the 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 story around you know how we came to it and then also one rum or style slash type of rum that we'd really like to try in 2020 um which which again that's that's you know something i think is fun about and i guess this isn't really unique to rum but yeah it, it you can spend years drinking it and still there are rums from certain parts of the world or styles of rum that you still have yet to get to there's you can really dive deep into just one country's rums and spend years there and before you kind of move (laughs) on to other ones so i can you know kind of get us started with that you know when i think back on 2019 one of the 
experiences that really sticks out in my mind was I was in San Francisco uh, because I was doing one of those uh, panels that I mentioned. I was moderating a panel mm-hmm. on American rum at the California Rum Fest, which is put on by the Rum Lab, which does really wonderful events uh, all over the country. I would highly encourage you to attend one of those if if you are interested in rum. And uh, the night before the event, I went to Zombie Village in San Francisco. Well, obviously it's in San Francisco, (laughs) but uh, it's a tiki bar. And I was meeting up with one of the distillers who was going to be on the panel. Uh, His name's Earl Brown. He's he's co-founded a a distillery called Wright and Brown in Oakland. And so I got there. I didn't see Earl. I kind of sat at the bar. I was having a drink. And then uh, Karen Hoskin, who who I mentioned earlier, who wrote that the very article I'm talking about that inspired this idea of the continuum of rum, she walked by the bar and I recognized her. I talked to Karen before, but we hadn't met in person, but she was also going to be on my panel the next day. So I quickly introduced myself to her. Um, she invited me to come and join her and uh, her friends and she had a, a coworker with her as well. Yeah. So I sat down and I was looking at, you know, at the uh, at Zombie Village's rum list I immediately saw that they had uh, Claren on the menu, which was a type of rum I had not gotten to experience yet. I live in Nashville, Tennessee, and while I wouldn't say it's a rum desert, it's it's certainly <laughs> you know it's it's not like living in it's not Miami. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not it's not Miami. It's not New York. It's not uh, the major cities in California like San Francisco, L.A., etc., where you have access to a lot of um, you know smaller. Uh, imported rums. So I hadn't had the opportunity to try Clarin yet. And uh, I ordered the Clarin Vival, uh, just, mm-hmm. you know, a, a neat pour of it. And they brought it out. And, you know, I, I knew about the production methods. I, I knew it came from Haiti. I knew that this particular variety was uh, distilled from uh, fermented sugarcane juice. Right. And so in my mind, I was expecting something analogous to, you know, rum agricole from right. Mar- right. like an unaged uh, rum agricole from Martinique, which I had had before. And they bring it out in a, in a glass with, you know, a, a bit of paper on top. And I take that uh, bit of paper off the top and immediately you smell like the esters from there. Um, and, I, yeah. you know, it reminded me slightly of rum agricole, but I knew I was in for like a different beast when when I when the smell hit me. Yeah. And uh, I tasted it. And like I said, it was it reminded me of rum agricole, but so different, um, kind of like its wild cousin. There were just so many different flavors that were unexpected there was like some savory elements to it like almost wow. like a tomatoey smokiness wow. um it was really wild and just it was the exact kind of experience that i love about rum where you know you can drink rum for years and think you have I've a pretty good idea all. of what yeah. it is <laughs> um not necessarily seen at all, but just like, oh, you know, I kind of get what's out there. And uh, then you yeah. have something that completely like, oh, well, <laughs> I wasn't expecting this. So it was one of those great moments. And, you know, sharing it with with rum people was really cool. And, and something else, you know, Earl, who I mentioned earlier, he eventually joined us. And he had just distilled his own batch of fresh cane juice rum. They had sourced some sugar cane from the Central Valley in California and juiced it and done a oh, really wow. small batch. And he, he snuck a little bottle out of his bag and, and poured us all some. So <laughs> Isn't you that know, the best when that happens? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it was just so cool to be, you know, having this, uh, experiencing this rum from Haiti, which has a really long history, but is just kind of starting to be shared more widely with the rest of the world. Uh, and, and then, you know, at the same time get to experience something this fresh cane juice rum from california and it's just yeah. i think there's a lot of uh really interesting things happening in rum right now and it was one of those moments that i felt was like really emblematic of what has drawn me to the category so yeah. that is my 2019 i i, I want to hear your unforgettable experience before we talk about what we're looking forward to, what our mission is for 2020 okay let me ask you real quick the Vival, yeah. that's an unaged uh rum correct Yes, yeah, and actually, so it's one of the bottlings um, that was done through Vellier, and uh, they did Clarence, I think, from four different producers in Haiti, which there are hundreds of, of small producers throughout right. the island. But, uh, which is Vival, really cool. Yeah, yeah it, it's it, Vaval was one of them. Uh, I'd encourage you, you know, go to Vellier's website, just just search like Claren Vaval. You'll see all the different varieties that they've bottled. The initial uh, releases were all unaged, and I just, I was going scrolling through the 
TTB label approvals on their mm-hmm. website a, yeah. a few weeks ago, and I saw some label approvals for a few aged Claren oh, releases nice. from Velier. So I, it looks like those are on the horizon and probably coming out very soon. So I'm very interested to try some of those as well to see, yeah. you know, what what the barrel has done to uh, to all those interesting flavors. I've had the the saju. Yeah, I've I've heard great things about the really, really, really yeah. good. Really enjoyed that, and as you mentioned, I agree, a hundred percent. Just, just totally different uh, right. of an experience. So that was that was awesome. Um, so okay, so my twenty nineteen. So I'll I'll try to follow that up. That's tough. Um, uh, my twenty nineteen. I think I have a little bit more of a broad idea of what I won't forget about twenty nineteen, and that sure. is essentially uh, Barbados rum. Mm. And so I mentioned that in 2018, I did a lot of exploration with different things uh, in different production uh, countries uh, producing rum. And early in 2019, I found Barbados. And uh, when I say Barbados, I mean, uh, I started uh, with uh, a few different producers uh, of um, from Barbados, Mount Gay being one of them uh, and a few others. Uh, But what really uh, stuck out to me probably more than anything else, and I, I know I'm not alone in saying this, is uh, Four Square Rums. Absolutely. And so I had my first Four Square Rum experience in 2019, uh, and that made such a mark on me that I just fell down the fanboy Four Square hole. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, and ended up with, I think, four bottles in 2019. Uh, or, well, I guess, no, the newest one, I just picked up a bottle of Primus, uh I guess that's technically 2020, <laughs> but so I have a, a little collection of Foursquare going on, and um, I really, really enjoy uh, their products overall. I find that the unadulterated aged rum from Barbados is, for me, uh, the best experience I've had with rum so far in just the the cleanness of the spirit, the uh, not overwhelming sweetness that, that's behind it, but the complexity involved in it. Uh, I just I, I can't get over it. Uh, yeah. And it's it's just so good, and I could spend way too long talking about uh, uh, Foursquare in general. Um, I was lucky enough. You mentioned kind of that that little bottle that comes out of somebody's bag when you're at an event. I was right. at an event in 2019, and I was lucky enough that uh, a, a nice uh, guy pulled out Holmes Key, and which you know is a Barbados rum as well. And uh, and so I got to try that, and that was one of the reasons I was so excited for us to do the Eric K interview uh, because he's he's uh, the purveyor of Holmes Key, and uh, I really really enjoyed that uh, release as well. Um, right, which that one was sourced from the Four Square Run Distillery. So, right, yeah, right. So it makes fitting, sense, fitting right, right into your Four Square Rabbit Hole. <laughs> exactly. Um, so that was, I think, for me, 2019 was really marked by. Uh, all things Barbados rum. Uh, I still love Mount Gay XO. I have uh, a couple other uh, offerings there from from Barbados. Even Plantation does some stuff uh, Barbados rum as well that I enjoy. So uh, that's that's kind of my experience with 2019 and and how it's progressed in terms of my hobby uh, for for enjoying uh, rum. Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly, I think Foursquare is something uh, that that most people listening to this podcast. Uh, have an appreciation for and uh, if if you haven't experienced yet highly recommend it um, you know you coming from a bourbon background yeah I think Foursquare a lot of times is sort of a natural bridge for people um, coming coming into the world of rum from bourbon people describe it as bourbon-esque and I, I always see where they're coming from and I see why it makes sense as, as um, a, a great introduction for people who like bourbon. Yeah. Um, sometimes I feel like the way people talk about it, though, makes it seem like a little closer to bourbon than it actually is. Like it's still very much emblematic of what rum tastes like. Like I don't, t- I don't drink it and think like, oh, well, this tastes like bourbon. Like no, it tastes like rum. Um, which, which I, I know is not what you were trying to say. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, yeah. it's a, it's a great introduction to people if you have someone in your, in your life who is a bourbon fan. Foursquare is is a great. It's the way to to, go, to yeah. let them try. There's yeah. a similarity, I think, in the, in the kind of the spice of it. Uh, yeah, and that's it. And I agree with you a hundred percent that it, it's it's a very much a rum. Uh, but I agree with you also that hey, if you do have those bourbon fans in your life, that's that's the one you want to try. And it's it's a little bit tough for some people because I think one of the things that and I know we talk about this in some of our interviews, and it'll be continue to be a thing we'll talk about with rum in general is uh, four square releases are uh, on average I'd say what sixty to one hundred one hundred and twenty dollars a bottle. Yeah, I, well, and one one of the things about that though is you don't necessarily have to go straight to like the four square exceptional cask releases. That's true. Um, like if you have a total wine, you can get Dourleys, which is a, a really that's sourced from 
uh, for Square, and really it is a release, lot more yeah. inf- uh, affordable. Real McCoy is another ROM yep. that is sourced from Foursquare. So, you know, we don't have a total wine yet here in Nashville, although I believe oh, no. we're getting one we're getting <laughs> one soon. But uh so so Duralease is not really available widely here, but uh, or at all because I think it's total wine exclusive. But yeah. uh, or Real even McCoy, the RL Seals 10 year. Right. Uh, yeah. As a inexpensive introduction to Barbados rum from Foursquare. Uh, that is really, really good. Right. Uh, and they right. had that on sale at Total Wine here. I don't want to make you jealous for under <laughs> under $20. Wow. That, yeah, that does that does hurt a little bit. Incredible. Um, yeah. I won't hold it against you, though. So <laughs> um, kind of to wrap things up, I think uh, real quickly, we want to give a little window into what we're hoping to be able to try in, in 2020 uh, because, you know, there's certainly plenty uh, of the rum world left to explore so for me one of the things that i have not been able to get my hands on easily uh at all where i live is uh a long aged uh cask strength undosed demerara rum so i know these are out there there have been plenty of independent bottlings released uh you know in europe that you know are sourced from diamond distillers down in Guyana. Uh, it's just, I, they have not come across uh, my radar when I'm, you know, browsing liquor store shelves. Mm-hmm. I haven't been able to get my hands on one yet. And, you know, I know El Dorado has started doing small undosed releases. Of, yeah. You know, they have some that are from specific stills at the distillery and stuff like that. So I'm hoping to get my hands on one of those in 2020 because, you know, uh, to this point, most of what I've had has just been from the El Dorado line. Uh, you know, Hamilton 86 is an example of one that I yeah. believe is does not have any added sugar, um, you know, but it's it's not very, super long aged or anything like that. I think it's a relatively young rum, so I'm hoping to get my hands on that in 2020. Uh, I think that's an awesome one. I did see those El Dorado releases uh, that are, that are coming out soon, and they look super intriguing. And yeah. I'm I'm right right along with you that I hope to get one of those uh, in my glass in 2020. So yeah, for me, one of the things that I'm really looking forward to in 2020, or at least hoping will be the case, is uh, to see more U.S. independent bottlers come about. Um, I think that's something that uh, the, the world has uh, some really, really good independent bottling offers, uh, the Valiers and the Samarolis. And I was able to experience a Samaroli uh, late last year, which I really, really thoroughly enjoyed. And, uh, you know, we, when we spoke with uh, Eric Kay of Holmes Key, who is a U.S. independent bottler, one of the very, very first pioneers of that, um, we, we talked a lot about this subject. And I'm, I'm really hoping that uh, we will be able to see more U.S. independent bottlers uh, crop up in 2020. Uh, as well as, I think, hopefully get some better access to some of the ones uh, around the world. Uh, I I don't know about you, Will, but I find it very difficult sometimes to find those uh, offerings. And it can be really, really tough when you see it being released, but you're not able to get it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, here in Nashville, I've never seen anything from Velier on, on store shelves here, or Samaroli for that matter, or, you know, any of the other um, prominent uh, worldwide independent bottlers that, that everyone sees, you know, being posted on Facebook and yeah. uh, in forums and stuff like that. So I, I definitely have plenty of rum FOMO and would welcome <laughs> uh, greater greater distribution from those companies. And also, like you said, uh, hopefully we'll see more uh, independent release, uh, releases coming from people in the U.S. like Eric, who uh, maybe have a little bit easier access to the markets over here. But definitely listen to that episode. I, I think he he gave some good insight into sort of the reasons for why we don't uh, see as much of those releases over here and, you know, how he's hoping to change that a little bit. So I'm right there with you. What, by the way, you, you mentioned yeah. you were able to try a Samaroli. Where where uh, was that sourced from? Uh, so it was a, a quote unquote Caribbean, I believe 2002. I don't have the bottle okay. sitting in front of me, but what that... So it was a blend. It was a blend. Yes. Now, what that essentially meant in my understanding was uh, after looking at some forums is this is very, very similar to a European release, which has... Cuba on the bottle. Interesting. So, you know, of course, with the restrictions that we have right now in America, you can't import the Cuban rum over. Right. So, uh, again, this is my understanding uh, is that this is very similar to that release insofar as it's roughly like 90% Cuban rum sourced and okay. with a little bit of mix of, of some other uh, uh, Latin American nations uh, that's kind of created gotcha. that blend. So this was one of the really first times that I actually had access to a predominantly Cuban rum. Uh, and really, really, really enjoyed it. It's it. Also, I, I don't know if all Samarolis have this in common because this is the only one I've ever tried. But it has a Scotch-like quality to it, and that's to be expected wow. since it's aged 
uh, in Scotland. Okay, so continentally aged primarily. Well, I don't know primarily. I'd have to look up and see. I know it gets aged uh, okay. where in the Caribbean, and then it, it it gets also secondary maturation, I think is the right term, right. Uh, up in, uh, in the UK and Scotland. So yeah, that was a great product, and I'm looking forward to sharing that one with you soon. Hopefully, I can get you a, a sample of that. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, looking forward to that. Awesome. All right, so I think that about wraps it up for us for this episode today. Um, We want to thank you all very much for listening, and uh, we hope that if you haven't already done so, that you'll go ahead and check out the other two episodes we have immediately available uh, and listen to those as well. Our social media, uh, facebook.com forward slash The Rumcast, and then Instagram as well under The Rumcast. Our website can be found at www.rumcast.com, and we will have our episodes available uh, for release there as well as on the main uh, places you can get your podcasts from so definitely subscribe uh apple Podcasts, anywhere you get your podcasts and if you uh feel so inclined we would love for you to leave us a review as well and let us know what you think about the podcast but yeah um you will hear from us again soon and if you haven't already go ahead and check out the other episodes that are already available but we'll talk to you again soon And the final message we wanted to leave you with today is that uh, Will and I both love the rum hobby and we're willing to bet that if you're still listening, you probably love it a lot too. So as such, we wanted to uh, make sure that everybody uh, remembers when it comes to consuming alcohol, even the really good stuff, moderation is key. And for your own health and safety and for the health and safety of others, we want to remind everyone to please enjoy rum responsibly. Don't drink and drive. And we will see you again next time on the Rumcast.